Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Ian Crawford. He is Professor of Planetary Science and Astrobiology at Birkbeck College, University of London. His research activities mostly lie in the fields of space exploration, especially lunar science and exploration, and the science of astrobiology, which you're going to talk about today. So, Dr. Crawford, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Okay, well, you're welcome, of course. Okay, so the first question I would like to ask you, Dr. Crawford, and perhaps most people don't know about this field is, what is astrobiology? Because I guess that uh, we could say, at least from one perspective, that it is an integrative science, right? It integrates several different scientific fields, correct? Yes. So astrobiology is the name that's being coined to describe the search for life in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a very interdisciplinary science because if you want to search for life in the universe, then this brings in aspects of uh, astronomy, biology, planetary science, geology, uh, even aspects of philosophy. So all of these different topics have to are uh, incorporated into any would be incorporated into any search for life in the universe so astrobiology has to contain uh, all of them mm -hmm. and when we go and search and try to find life in the universe particularly in other planets what are some of the criteria that we use or the parameters under which we set that search for life there are several aspects to that. I mean, obviously, it's a huge universe out there, right? And, and uh, an enormous number of possibilities uh, exist. Uh, and we it's very difficult to guess. So, so the first thing is it's, it's very important to keep a very open mind. However, the second thing is, if we're going to be serious about searching for life in the universe, we have to start somewhere. And the only place that we know life has appeared in the universe is on our own planet. So currently astrobiology, for the most part, tries to um, examine those aspects of the history of life on Earth, which we think might be common to life on other planets, and this helps focus the search. So, for example, our kind of life requires liquid water as a medium for the chemical biochemistry to occur in. So if you are searching for our kind of life, then a key criteria would be planets that either have liquid water or have had liquid water in the past. Similarly, our kind of life is based on carbon-based molecules. So a secondary criterion for searching outdoor planets would be planets that have the right sources of raw materials like carbon, particularly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, that a biochemistry can use. So currently, these are the criteria but I do think it's important to stress that these are kind of practical criteria because we have to start somewhere and choosing these criteria mean we're already kind of assuming that life will be like Earth life. So in parallel to all of that, we also have to keep an open mind and, and be prepared that life might be completely different. It might not require liquid water. It might not be based on carbon. But nevertheless, insofar as we can practically design experiments or spacecraft, then a working assumption at the moment is we should start at least by looking for our kind of life on planets which are relatively warm, wet with liquid water, with sources of carbon and other key ingredients. Mm -hmm. So currently when we find a new planet and particularly if it is a, an exoplanet, that is a planet that is positioned outside of our solar system, uh, the way we decide the probability of it hosting life is based on those criteria that you just uh, said? Well, I think ideally it would be, but very little work has been done on characterizing the habitability of exoplanets yet. Um, I think, uh, it's, and that will be quite difficult. And in any case, we kind of be, we, we're not going to have a lot of choice. Nature has already decided which are the exoplanets closest to the Earth, and these would be the easiest to study. And so we will study them anyway, 
because they're nearby and because they're the easiest to study. Um, so I, I think there are two aspects to this. I think it's important. I mean, astrobiology has different strands. One strand consists of looking for life elsewhere in our solar system, mm -hmm. um, which we should talk about. And then looking for life on other planetary systems, these are different because the techniques are different, i.e. in our solar system we can send spacecraft to study planetary, system, planetary surfaces in situ, like the Curiosity rover on Mars. We cannot yet do that for, for, for planets in other solar systems. So the search for habitable, trying to assess whether an exoplanet is habitable, can only rely on astronomical tools and the, the composition of the planet's atmosphere, as we might be able to deduce by astronomical spectroscopy. But the truth is we haven't been able to do that yet for any, well, we've done, we, it's been done for a small number of giant exoplanets, but it's not been done for any Earth-sized exoplanets yet because it's enormously challenging. Whereas explore, searching for life in our own solar system is technically much more, um, uh, is much more within our capabilities at the moment. Mm -hmm. And when people that do work in astrobiology talk about Goldilocks conditions, uh, what are those conditions? So the, when it comes to looking for life on exoplanets, the one of the top criteria, you're correct, there is this, the habitable zone concept, otherwise known as the Goldilocks zone. This is the one thing astronomers can work out with our existing data. If we discover a planet around another star, we can easily determine its distance from the star because its orbital period is related to its distance by Kepler's laws. And so we can find for any exoplanet, we can know its distance from its star and therefore we can know how much uh, sunlight or starlight it is getting mm -hmm. therefore we can estimate its surface temperature and then we can see whether it's um within the zone of distances from the star where liquid water would be stable on the surface this is the so-called habitable zone um and currently uh yeah we can for all known exoplanets we can decide whether they exist within the habitable zone defined in terms of whether liquid water would be stable on the planet's surface. But we do have to be really um, careful with this concept of a habitable zone. Could be, I mean, so consider the moon. The moon is at exactly the same distance from the sun as the Earth is. Therefore, it's in exactly the same habitable zone. Uh, but the moon is not habitable. It has no atmosphere at all. So we can't really, just because a planet falls within a naive concept of a habitable zone, we're not entitled to claim it's habitable. We're not entitled to claim that it has liquid water. Until we know something about its atmosphere, its atmospheric composition, whether it's got an atmosphere, its surface pressure, um, all of these things would also, uh, we'd need to know before we could really judge whether it was habitable or not. So the habitable zone concept has these fundamental limitations. It also doesn't apply to places like icy moons, like Europa. So Europa, Jupiter's moon Europa, has a probably a, an ocean of liquid water under its icy shell. It may well be habitable, but it's well outside the traditional definition of a habitable, habit, the habitable zone as usually defined. So the habitable zone is quite a naive concept. I think it's used far too frequently in popular discussions of extraterrestrial life, um, where the expectation seems to be there exists this habitable zone. If you find planets within this habitable zone, then they're going to be habitable. Uh, well, it, we, uh, for all known exoplanets, it's premature. We just don't know enough about them to, mm -hmm. to, to be certain. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, when it comes to planets that fall outside of that habitable zone, uh, is, is it also true that perhaps the knowledge that we have from studying creatures like the extremophiles, that is, creatures that are able to live and thrive in what we consider to be extreme conditions, does that knowledge also uh, changes the view that we have about uh, what might be a habitable planet? Yes, I think this is one of the most exciting things that's happened in biology over the last 25 years or so. Um, is the discovery that there are microorganisms that can live in conditions that are, we, we would consider extreme mm -hmm. in terms of temperature and pressure and radiation. 
Uh, but, but, uh, but nevertheless, life has found on the earth, life has found a means to survive in these locations. So that this is one of the other pillars of astrobiology. In addition to the space exploration and the astronomy, the study of, it, of life on Earth can inform the search for life elsewhere in the universe. Because if we find extremophiles living at a hyperthermal vent in the, uh, in the floor of the Earth's oceans, under conditions that might be similar to a hydrothermal vent in the floor of, say, Europa's ocean, then yes, we, we don't know Europa is inhabited, but we do know, or we could argue, that it, it, it contains habitable environments because life has learned how to inhabit such places on the Earth. And the same for Mars and the same for exoplanets. And so the, the, range, the range of environmental parameters that life can has evolved to um, uh, uh, utilise has grown larger and larger and larger over the years. And what we found is that some of these environments, which seem extreme, uh, but where life nevertheless exists on the Earth, overlap with environmental conditions we can find on other planets. And so to that extent, we can claim these other planets are habitable because life has found a solution to living in such environments. What we don't know is whether any of these other planets are in fact inhabited. So we don't know that at all. And that's what astrobiology is trying to find out. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that we're just talking about extremophiles because I guess that when most people and particularly people who are not really scientifically minded, when they think about the possibility of life occurring on other planets, perhaps the first things that come to their mind are things like uh, plants or animals that is more complex uh, forms of life but when we're thinking from an astrobiology perspective about the forms of life that uh, are, are more likely to occur on other planets uh, we we should start perhaps by thinking about microorganisms or something like that, like that? yes Yes, absolutely, and, and for several reasons. Um, I mean, the first reason is microorganisms can survive a much wider range of environmental um, parameter space. So there's, there's really no possibility of finding really large, complicated animals. Well, I was going to say there's no possibility. I think for places like Europa, we have to kind of maybe keep a slightly open mind. We've no idea what might have evolved underneath its icy shell. But nevertheless, microorganisms can survive a much wider range of conditions. The, the, the more complicated animals get, uh, or plants, then the, more, the narrower the range of environments they can survive in. Uh, but the other, th the other thing that I think is really important is to look at this historically. It's why the history of life on Earth is so important in informing astrobiology. Um, so the Earth is four and a half billion years old. There's reasonably good fossil evidence that life was present on the Earth by 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago. But multi-celled animals didn't appear on this planet till 600 million years ago, so 0.6 of a billion years. So for the vast, so the planet Earth has been inhabited by life for most of its history. But for about three quarters of that history, all life on Earth was microbial. So this tells us that it takes a long time. I mean, on this planet, life did manage to evolve from single-celled entities to complicated multi-celled animals and plants and fungi. Uh, but it took a long time. It took three quarters of the age of the planet. And that might imply that it's difficult to do. And so if it, if it, all, if it, if it takes a long time, if wherever life evolves in the universe, if it always takes three or 4,000 million years to evolve from microorganisms to complicated life, then clearly most life in the universe will be microbial. For every planet where there might be something complex life, like animals and plants, there are likely to be millions of planets inhabited by microorganisms, just because of the length of time it seems to take to evolve complicated life from more simple life. And I think this temporal perspective is, uh, is really, really important. And I think it's really important that people uh, I think it's actually quite important that the wider wider public, whether they're interested in science or not, grasp this temporal perspective. I mean, this is where astrobiology touches base a little bit with this new uh, concept of big history, which is an attempt to try and integrate the history of humanity with the history of the universe and 
and, 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 and bring home to people these enormous time scales. Because um, I think once you grasp these time scales, then it kind of makes it obvious that most life in the universe is probably going to be simple rather than complex. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to talk about big history later in the interview. But now let me just ask you, when we're looking for life on other planets, isn't it also the case that sometimes perhaps it's a matter of how we define life? Because let's say that, for example, we were to find uh, biochemistry, per perhaps not really cells, but just uh, biochemical reactions occurring on some planet. Should we consider that life or not? Well, I think so. Biologists have never managed to get to a definition of life that everyone can agree on. So there are various working definitions of life, but no one, abs abs no, there doesn't exist a, a rigid scientific definition of life that you can definitely use. Every definition that people come up with has exceptions. Um, so my, t my view on this is it doesn't really matter. I mean, what, what, what really, what really distinguishes life from non-life and things in the interface between is complexity uh, and if you find compli complicated chemical or biochemical processes happening elsewhere in the universe then these will be interesting in their own right it doesn't really matter whether you define them as life or not i mean they they exist and they're interesting and we they'll be worthy of study and they will teachers about the universe so getting hung up on whether the def whether things are alive or not kind of implies that if they're not alive they don't matter but but whether they matter or not isn't in the definition it's in their complexity um i think so i i, I I'm, I'm not overly worried that there isn't a a, a very rigid definition of life. I think we should go out and explore the universe and find out what's there anyway. And when we do that, um, we'll gradually, you know, we'll, we'll learn more about the, the, the extent to which matter can organize itself in complex ways. And, and some of those ways we may call life and some not life, but you know, it's, it'll be interesting anyway, whether or not we choose to call them life or not. I mean, does it matter if something's called a plant or an animal or a fungi? I mean, these are complicated entities. So we shouldn't just the, the labels. I mean, the labels are just our human attempt to try and put things together into different categories. Um, uh, and with the no uh, and with the knowledge that we have nowadays, uh, in terms of our solar system, what would you say are the planets or moons where it is where it would be most like most likely for us to find uh, life forms so there's a growing short list of such places in the solar system if we're talking about life today mm. um then the, i think that the, the short list would be the deep subsurface of mars so aquifers buried uh, in the deep subsurface of, of Mars, and then the icy moons of the outer solar system, Europa, Enceladus, Titan. These would be the main places on a short list to search for life today. If we went back to the early solar system, um, like three and a half thousand million years ago, when life was starting on the Earth, then the surface of Mars would be near the top of this list. So the surface of Mars isn't near the top of the list today because the surface of Mars is a very hostile place and, and probably is sterile. Um, and, and any life on Mars today is probably buried if, if it exists. But three and a half thousand million years ago, the surface of Mars was very different. There were rivers of liquid water, there were cratered lakes, there was a thicker atmosphere. The planet had a warmer temperature because it has to have done because otherwise the water wouldn't have been liquid and we know the water was liquid so so if you look at mars as it was three and a half to four thousand million years ago that would have been a habitable environment and this is one of the reasons why which is driving the exploration of mars today to try and find out whether life actually did arise on mars when it was a much more habitable place than it is today 
Uh, but if I, I just want to make one other point, because I think it's really important and sometimes I lost sight of. Um, although there's this list of uh, places on the, uh, in the solar system that could be potentially habitable or have been habitable, and ideally we want to explore the Mars, or we want to explore them all, uh, Mars is still a special case. Uh, and the, the reason Mars is a special case is, uh, is not only that it's relatively nearby, it's relatively accessible, much more importantly is that we know that life appeared on the Earth about, say, 4,000 million years ago. You know, every, certainly before 3.5 billion years ago, uh, based on the fossil evidence. And we now know enough about Mars to know that at that time, Earth and Mars were very similar planets. They had liquid water on their surface, they had carbon dioxide atmospheres, they had a lot of volcanic rocks being formed. And under those conditions, life did arise on the Earth. So you could predict that if, it, if it's going to arise on warm, wet, rocky planets with lots of volcanoes, it should have arisen also on Mars. It might be extinct now, Martian life, but, but if life always arises uh, quickly on planets like what the Earth was like 3.8 billion years ago, that predicts that life should have arisen on Mars as well when the conditions were similar. So, and, and, and then this is testable. We can test this by going to Mars to find out whether it did or not. Um, and if it did, this is a hugely important discovery for astrobiology because if we can prove that life arose independently on two planets, like what the Earth and Mars were like three and a half billion years ago, the universe is full of such planets. I mean, trillions and trillions of planets in the galaxy that are like what the Earth and Mars were like four billion years ago. So, so finding an independent origin of life on Mars under those conditions would lead us to predict that the galaxy is full of life. But if we explore Mars and we define that despite the fact <laughs> environments were similar to the Earth four billion years ago, despite the, habit despite the fact it was habitable, life never arose there, then this tells us that life requires something else other than just warm, wet, rocky planets. Something special happened here, and we've no idea what the probability of that happening was, could be a very low probability event. And so in that situation, despite the universe being full of warm, wet, rocky planets, life might be very rare. And so exploring Mars can help us address that question. Exploring Europa can't, because life, very interesting from an astrobiology point of view, but Europa has never been like the early Earth. <laughs> so, so, but, but Mar, early Mars was like the early Earth. And so this is why exploring Mars is, I think, so fundamental to um, trying to gauge how common life is in the universe as a whole. Mm -hmm. And if we arrive at a planet like Mars and explore it, and we don't find life uh, there uh, existing at the moment, uh, what are the tools and methods that we have at our disposal to really determine that that planet uh, hosted life before? Well, you're into the realms of, well, two, there are two possibilities. Um, one is to see whether any early life on Mars, given that the surface has now become so hostile, mm. it's conceivable that life might have migrated into the subsurface, as I mentioned mm. earlier. So at depths of uh, two or three kilometers below the surface of Mars, it's expected that there will be liquid water. Uh, so water near the surface of Mars is frozen because the planet is now so cold. But at depths of two or three kilometers, water is expected to be liquid in cracks within the rocks. So these are called aquifers. And we know on the Earth, microorganisms live in aquifers on the Earth. And so uh, any Martian life might have migrated to the subsurface. This will be difficult to access. I mean, it would require the way we study the Earth's aquifers on the Earth is to drill, drill down to depths of uh, two or three kilometers. Well, we can do that on the Earth because we've got all the infrastructure. We don't yet have any infrastructure for dr deep drilling on Mars. Uh, but one day we might have to um, install it, the capability, if we really want to explore the subsurface of Mars. Uh, that could be an argument for human exploration of Mars in the future. Uh, the other possibility is that even if there was life arose on early Mars, it might, be, it might have been extinct long ago. It might not be still alive in the subsurface. 
Uh, and then you're looking for fossils. You'd have to look for microfossils. So, so this would be Martian paleontology, searching for fossils, for fossil microorganisms, presumably, uh, in ancient rocks. But then th this is how we know the Earth had life on it three and a half billion years ago, because we found fossilized microorganisms in rocks of that age. So the, 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 what, what one would uh, have to do is identify suitable rocks, probably sedimentary rocks of great age on Mars, and search them for microfossils like we do on the Earth. Um, and, and then at some point, we've, I mean, it's, it's difficult to know when you will get a definitive answer. I mean, you can start, you might be lucky, you might find fossils quickly, you might not find any fossils, and then and you might keep searching and never and ever finding fossils. And at some point after the year, someone will have to make a decision, that, a tentative decision, that after so many years of studying Mars rocks, we haven't found any fossils, therefore probably there was never any life on early Mars. But I don't know how we would ever know definitely because just because you don't find any fossils doesn't mean there are none there. They might just be very rare. Um, but the, but that, that, those are the way we'd have to, we'd go about addressing it, um, whether there was early life on Mars through, through searching for fossils. Mm -hmm. And when is it reasonable for us to decide uh, stop looking for, to stop looking for life on a particular planet? I mean, I'm, and I'm not trying to talk about perhaps limited resources or something like that here, but just from a scientific perspective, when would we decide that, uh, okay, it no longer makes sense to continuing looking for life on this planet? I, I, I don't think it's possible to answer that question. I think, uh, and I think it does ultimately depend on resources. Because if you had infinite resources, you'd keep looking forever if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the question was important enough. Um, uh, and I think finding out whether life ever arose on Mars is a very important question. Um, uh, but, but resources are not infinite. So I, I don't know whether we could ever argue that. I mean, you could, you could say, I mean, new fossils are being found on the Earth every year. Um, no one ever argues that we found enough fossils on the Earth, we should just stop because new things are constantly being found, but that's because we have the resources to, to, to do it. So I, I don't think you could ever say, you, I mean, I don't think you can prove a negative just because, you know, it's the, the, the old adage uh, that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you don't find any evidence doesn't mean that there's nothing there to be found. So I don't think we can possibly answer that question. Um, but the way I think it will go, um, the way I hope it will go in the in the future, the quite distant future, um, is we'll continue searching for Mars, with, exploring Mars with small robotic spacecraft. Uh, eventually, this will probably tell us that the near surface environment doesn't have any life on it. Uh, then this will be followed by human expeditions, eventually human outposts like the um, Antarctic uh, research stations. Once you've got that kind of scientific infrastructure on Mars, just as in the Antarctic, um, you've got a scientific infrastructure there that can support a vast range of different scientific activities. Uh, and over time, the infrastructure grows. Uh, I mean, you could imagine a time in, in 300 years time where there might be cities on Mars and universities on Mars and university geology departments on Mars who might still be searching Mars for evidence of early life, right? I, 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 and and uh, so I think it, I don't think we, I don't think you can ever give up on it. You can never prove that a planet has never hosted life. I, I don't think. So, so the, really the question is whether it's really important to get an answer. Um, I think it, for the reasons I gave earlier, I think Mar it is particularly important to try and get an answer for Mars because we know conditions on early Mars were like the conditions on early Earth and we know life did arise here. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's, it's important to try and find out whether it did or did not also arise on Mars. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the particular case of looking for uh, or searching for intelligent life, I mean, what are some of the main differences between uh, approaching the searching for life in general and particularly looking for intelligent life 
uh, uh, somewhere well, in the universe. Well, they're, they're very different, of course. So, I mean, I think we can now be certain there's no there's no intelligent life elsewhere in our solar system because mm. surely have discovered it or it would have discovered us by now. So the only possibility is that um, intelligent life might have arisen on planets around other stars. Um, the way this is addressed has been addressed mostly to date is through radio astronomy uh, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, where for 50 years now, small groups of radio astronomers have been listening to the sky trying to detect extraterrestrial artificial radio signals. Not, none have been detected to date. But then we haven't actually completed, a, even though it's been going for 50 years, it's only in the last few years, really, that these instruments have become very sensitive uh, and, and able to um, simultaneously study a very wide range of radio wavelengths. So the searches are getting more and more sophisticated all the time. Nothing's been found yet. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to be found. So, yeah, we should keep on, we should keep on listening with the SETI searches because that's relatively cheap. It doesn't cost much to do. A bit of tele just just take time from radio telescopes, of course. Um, but still, it's relatively cheap to do, and and it costs us nothing really. So we should keep um, listening. But we you could we could ask the same question that you asked earlier, though. When when will we give up? We haven't had any radio signals in fifty years. If in, in another fifty years we don't detect any, should we stop listening? Or another hundred? Or another thousand? <laughs> um, given that it's relatively cheap to do, I think we should just keep listening. Um, because one day something may be discovered. Uh, that's one thing we can do. Uh, the other, the only, the other more extreme possibility would be to postulate that if intelligent life in the galaxy follows a similar technological evolution to our own, in addition to building um, radio telescopes, it may start building spaceships. If, it's, if these spaceships uh, become very sophisticated, such as they're able to travel between stars, which is an enormous undertaking, and we couldn't do it today, but, but some super advanced technologies might be able to, then conceivably they could have visited us in the past. And so something else we can do while we explore our own solar system that we you know, want to do for other reasons, is we could keep um, our eyes and minds open to the possibility of finding extraterrestrial artifacts or debris or things left behind in our solar system. Uh, not, nothing like that's been found uh, to date, of course, but it doesn't do any harm to keep um, keep our, an open mind uh, as we explore the solar system anyway to see. So, I, I but I think that's all we can do. We can uh, we can only explore our own solar system to, to look for evidence that we've been visited, and at the same time we can keep listening with radio telescopes to search for extraterrestrial signals. And these are currently our only ways of searching for intelligent life in the universe. Um, and of course, but it's complicated, of course, intelligent life may not wish to be discovered. I mean, in, by definition, intelligent life will have motivations. Uh, and we don't know what these motivations would be. But you could imagine intelligent life might arise in the universe, which might not wish to be detected, uh, which would make it you know, even harder for us to uh, discover. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be possible in any way that uh, there could have been or uh, there could be some forms of intelligent life in other planets that even if they get our the signals that we send, they wouldn't be able for some reason to interpret them or to respond to them in, in some way? Oh, oh yeah, I, I can Im you can imagine a lot of possibilities. I mean, firstly, not all intelligent life may develop technologies anyway, right? So you could imagine dolphins or octopuses, or I mean, octopuses might well be able to develop a technology because they have they have been able to manipulate things. Although, if you live in if you live underwater, then you arguably your capabilities might be less anyway for, for developing a technology because you wouldn't be able to initiate fire or things that. But who knows? Um, but you can certainly imagine intelligent creatures that wouldn't develop technologies, right? So, and they wouldn't be sending signals and they wouldn't be receiving ours, yet they could still exist. But we, we've got no way of interacting with, with such intelligences. If they can't come to us, uh, the only way of interacting with them would be for us to go to them in the future, when that would be you know, sometime in the future, because currently <laughs> we've got no possibility of traveling between the stars ourselves. 
Um, so yeah, there's obviously a range of possibilities from intelligences in the universe that don't develop technology to intelligences in the universe that do develop technology but choose not to use it to make contact or choose to hide if they are contacted. Um, but there are more frightening possibilities. There may be intelligences in the universe that develop technology and do use it to go expanding around the galaxy, colonizing planets um, and taking over other people's planets. And you can imagine that's a slightly less, you know, that's a darker range of possibilities but that must be possible as well um all we know at the moment is we've seen that we see no evidence for any of this at the moment the universe beyond our solar system the whole galaxy i mean it's sometimes been called the eerie silence uh and I, more, more um in astrobiology it's, it's known as the fermi paradox uh that the universe seems really quiet I mean, there's no evidence that it's teeming with millions of technological civilizations, broadcasting radio transmissions, traveling around in spaceships. There's not, you know, it looks very quiet. Um, and that's, the, and that's, that's, you know, that's all we know. But we, we should keep looking. Uh, my, my, own, my own view is I, I, I think intelligent life in the universe is probably pretty rare. I think if it was really common, we would know about it by now. Um, I don't think I don't think the universe is, would be as quiet as it seems to be if it had millions of technological civilizations in it on a on a technological trajectory that we are on, developing the means to to escape our planet and manipulate matter on large scales. It doesn't look like it's going on, um, but, but the, the, there are many possibilities that you know it might be going on and, and they're just hiding their activities from us. This is also possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when it comes to lunar exploration, what are still some of the main benefit, benefits that we can get from doing more of it? Not, not just at the scientific level, but perhaps at other levels, like, I, I don't know, the social, the political and, and things like that. Well, there are many aspects to that question. Um, for the moon, if you want to talk about the moon specifically to start with, um, the moon's interest scientifically is, I think, well, three, three at least aspects to it. Um, the first is the moon is a small rocky planet that geologically has been inactive for a long time. And therefore, it's preserved the early geological evolution of a rocky planet that more... Um, uh, larger planets like the Earth and Mars and Venus have uh, destroyed their own history because they've been evolving and convecting away. So the Moon is a good uh, record of the early evolution of a rocky planet. Uh, the Moon's surface, because the Moon has no atmosphere um, and no magnetic field, the Moon's surface preserves a record of things that have hit it throughout the whole solar system. So this includes meteorites, of course, but also solar wind particles and galactic cosmic ray particles. So there's a record in the lunar surface of the past history of the sun, and the past history of the galaxy. Uh, this is kind of the moon being used as a museum of early solar system history. Um, and the, the third scientific reason is that the moon's an excellent place potentially for doing astronomy from, especially the far side of the moon uh, is an ideal place for radio astronomy because it's shielded from the earth at all times. Uh, and it's shielded from the sun during the lunar night. So for two weeks every month, the far side of the moon is the quietest radio place anywhere in the solar system. Um, and so this would be an excellent place for doing radio astronomy. So these are the scientific reasons for wanting to continue to explore the moon. But, but as you mentioned, there are a whole range of other reasons for wanting to develop an ambitious human space program, which I think would start with the moon, but then gradually could build outwards to Mars, as we talked about, and maybe elsewhere. Um, but in addition to the scientific reasons for wanting to establish such a human space program, yes, there are a whole range of societal um, reasons for wanting to engage in it, I think. Um, from the quite uh, prosaic, which is kind of an economic justification uh, for space exploration, there are two sides to the economic argument. Um, space explore, exploration requires you to develop a lot of technology, innovative technology, which will be 
uh, of use not only in space exploration but in other fields as well. But then in the long term, we may find things in space that are economically useful, raw materials in space, which natural materials, which could be of use to the human economy. So that's an economic reason for wanting to develop um, space. Then there's, a, a, um, a, um, a, I think, a geopolitical reason. Um, so the Apollo missions were uh, predicated on a geopolitical reason, but it was a negative geopolitical reason. It was a, a competition between superpowers. But I think you can I think we can identify a positive geopolitical reasons for space exploration because it's an obvious focus for international cooperation. So we see that a little bit with the space station, with 15 nations collaborating on the space station. So you could imagine an international moon base, something like the space station on the moon, uh, would provide a focus for international collaboration. Um, and, and it does so in a very, you know, space exploration has a, a large public profile. So as an example to the world of many in different nations collaborating together peacefully in an exciting project, um, space exploration would be um, a useful example, I think, in today's world. It's not the only one, but I think it would be a positive example, nonetheless, of international cooperation showing that different nations can work together. Um, then there's the inspirational reasons uh, that space exploration is very exciting, especially to young people. So stimulating young people to engage in um, careers of science and engineering this could be beneficial. So, so there are all these multiple reasons why I think it's worth investing in a, an ambitious space program, which would start with the moon, because the moon is the obvious place, but wouldn't, need not be limited to the moon. Right? You could imagine it later moving to Mars and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And what would you reply to the criticisms that come from some people who say that, for instance, okay, so we have limited resources, particularly limited economic resources, and perhaps we should invest more in trying to solve the problems that we have on our planet and then if we have something left to invest in space exploration. I, I, think, I think this criticism, I understand, of course, where it comes from, but I think it's misplaced. And I think there are several answers to it. Uh, firstly, exploring space and sorting out problems on the Earth are not mutually exclusive. We can and should be doing both, especially when we consider that space exploration isn't actually all that expensive. Right. If you compare it to the the military budgets of the world, right? I mean, the world spends about a trillion dollars, maybe more now, 1.2 trillion, something. Just look it up every year on building weapons, and you and then you look at the Earth from outside, and this is a perspective that only space can give, right? But you take the space perspective and you see this planet hanging there, and it's managed to divide itself up into 200 nation states, which are. Uh, uh, claim sovereignty for themselves and which then spend over a trillion dollars a year building weapons with which to fight each other so the planet is using like uh, six or eight percent of its gross world product whatever that is just building weapons to fight itself with i mean if you were an intelligent alien looking from outside this would look ridiculous right uh, but then if you compare those military budgets with the space exploration budget, I mean, NASA's is by far the biggest, and it's only about 18 million. It's actually a very small fraction of the military budgets, right? So we should be solving the problems on the Earth, but we do have the resources to do both. And the place to take these resources from is not the space exploration budget, which is relatively small, um, but from other budgets, especially military budgets, which are enormous in comparison, and not only are not very useful, but they are in fact positively dangerous. So, so, so if the world is short of resources, it should be cutting down its military expenditures. Um, but we can be doing both. Uh, and one of the reasons I think we should be doing both is given that space exploration expenditure is quite modest compared to military budgets. You then look at the benefits you get from this relatively modest um, expenditure, not, not, not just the scientific benefits that we've talked about, right, but the societal benefits, which include being able to look back on the world from outside 
and seeing it as a small planet that really ought to be getting its act together um, and organizing itself in a more rational way. But that perspective, space ex that's a space exploration. Space exploration provides this perspective. Uh, and I think that can be a, um, a unifying influence um, on the world. So actually, rather than seeing space exploration competing with attempts to uh, solve problems on Earth, I think space ex exploration is part of the solution by providing a perspective of a, a, a small planet um, hanging all alone in space, that, that uh, once you grasp that perspective, so there's a powerful implicit argument there for sorting out many of its geopolitical and environmental problems. So I actually think space exploration can be part of the solution uh, rather than competing for resources for solving problems on the Earth. Mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to climate change, because I guess that this is one of the biggest, if not really the biggest problem that we have now to try to solve. What are some of the ways by which space exploration might help us tackle also that problem? Because, well, I mean, th there are people that... Uh, say, for example, and, and I'm not sure if this is the most important point to bring to the table or not, but there are people that say that perhaps one of the ways we should invest in space exploration would be for us to try to find other habitable planets, yeah. or if they are not habitable, habitable to try to terraform them as, altern yeah. as alternatives to the problems that we might bring uh, on this planet. Let's yeah, so I don't I don't think that's um, I mean, there are people who argue that way, but I think it's a very naive argument. Um, firstly, the Earth is the only for, for, for the foreseeable future. And I really mean centuries. The, the, the Earth is going to be the only place that can support human life in any, you know, any any quantity. You can imagine uh, bases on the Moon and Mars, like the Antarctic research stations with a few dozen or perhaps a few hundred people. But the vast majority of human beings are going to be living on this planet Earth for the foreseeable future. There's, there's, no, there's just no alternative for the next several hundred years. And many of our environmental problems uh, will become very um, severe on that timescale. So actually, if we want to give ourselves a future in space, and I think we, you know, we have that potential, we have to sort out these, these problems on the Earth. And we have to sort them out on the Earth. So you can't look to space exploration to start sending people to Mars because we've wrecked the Earth. I mean, this is ridiculous. No matter how you were to terraform Mars, even if you were, actually terraforming Mars would take tens of millennia to do it if you estimates for terraforming mars it will take thousands tens of thousands of years um but even if you did it's still never going to be as habitable as the earth right so so you, you we, we've got this fantastic planet here that we're sort of damaging uh if we're going to give ourselves any future either on the earth or in space we have to solve these environmental problems on the earth um, and it's not difficult, right? I mean, it doesn't, it's not difficult. We just have to stop digging fossil fuels out of the ground <laughs> and revert to solar power and uh, wind power, conceivably nuclear fusion in the future. We do, all we've got to do is stop burning fossil fuels. It's not, I mean, it really isn't rocket science. It, we can easily solve our environmental problems. The problem, the, 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 the problems are geopolitical. Um, uh, but insofar as space exploration can help, it's not colonizing Mars, it's by providing this perspective on the Earth. I mean, you can make the case that um, the uh, interest in the environmental uh, fragility of the Earth really started in the late 1960s when space exploration started getting going, especially the uh, Earthrise photograph taken by Apollo 8 astronauts in 1968, because that was the first time people had seen the Earth hanging in space. Um, that perspective, I think, I think what space exploration can do is provide that perspective into people's minds to realize that we live on this fragile planet and we should be implementing um, policies that protect it. But those policies we have to do on the Earth. I think we just have to, those are political problems to be dealt with on, here on this planet.
Okay, so let's move on to the last topic of our conversation, that is big history. So what is the relationship or what does astrobiology brings to the table uh, in big history? So big history is this uh, relatively new, new discipline, uh, which is an attempt to, a very important attempt, I think, to kind of, by historians, I mean, it was led by professional historians from the beginning, um, but to try and realize that human history is this tiny slice on the whole history of the universe. And yet things have happened in the history of the universe, which on which we, you know, if they hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here. Like obviously if there wasn't a universe, we wouldn't be here. But then the chemical elements that we're made out of have been made in stars and the planets have had to form and life has gone through, uh, evolved in complexity as we've discussed. And, and here we are, for, for, well, after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years later, at the, at the end of this tremendous evolutionary story. So that's big history. I think it's got strong synergies with astrobiology. Um, I teach an astrobiology module um, here at Birkbeck, and the first half of it, uh, yeah, it's really big history. It's the origin of the universe, the origin of the chemical elements, the origin of the planets, the evil origin and evolution of life. Um, all of that's kind of astrobiology and big history. Um, eventually, the disciplines then do diverge. Big history is interested in the evolution of humanity and then human cultural cultures and societies and human history. And astrobiology goes off in a different direction, looking for life on Mars and Europa and other other. other places but the the strong uh, the under the, the the certainly the way i organize my astrobiology course about the first half of it could equally be described as big history so i think i mean there are these strong synergies between astrobiology as, 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 inter as intellectual disciplines they have a very large amount of overlap in their subject matter because the subject matter is the history of the universe <laughs> which is clearly relevant to both. Mm -hmm. And when it comes specifically to astrobiology and to its role in big history, uh, finding life on other planets, would it bring a new perspective to our position as humans in the universe? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, de it depends, of course, a little bit on what, what is discovered. Uh, and many different things might be discovered because it's a very big universe out there. Um, I think one criticism that is sometimes leveled at big history is that it is of necessity anthropocentric. It looks at the history of the universe leading up to us, right? And, and most of the universe doesn't care about us. If there were intelligent beings or even non-intelligent beings on some other planet, they, they would have their own big histories evolutionary roots that lead to them. Um, the interesting thing though is the first part of this history will still be the same for everybody. That, that is all, if you, any, any life exists in the universe, will all agree on the first part of its big history. They'll all agree with the Big Bang and the origin of stars, the chemical elements, the evolution of life might be different nuances depending on how this life is organized or whatnot. But that part of the cosmic history will be common to all uh, intelligent life everywhere in the universe. But then at some point, they'll become separate and very and diverse separate histories. So yes, yeah, so a discovery of life elsewhere in the in the universe will broaden, the, certainly the, broaden the concept of big history to not just one, but many, multiple big histories. Every, every intelligent uh, life form in the universe will have its own big history. Um, so it would become a much more cosmopolitan uh, big history rather than the kind of rather very anthropocentric uh, one that we, we have at, at the moment. Um, but I think beyond leaving aside what the big historians make out of, out of it, discovering life elsewhere in the universe, yeah, it will be enormously important. Um, it does depend a little bit on whether this life is microbes on Mars or an intelligent civilization on Alpha Centauri. I mean, microbes on Mars, it would be scientifically enormously exciting, tell us a great deal about how life, how microbial life, style, how common microbial life is to be in the universe. But for human society, I don't know whether that would have a real impact. 
On the other hand, if we discover intelligent life elsewhere in the galaxy by receiving a radio signal, or even more dramatically, if we find an alien spaceship entering the solar system, then this is sure to have a profound impact because we'll f then no one will be able to pretend anymore that there's anything particularly special about us, that we, you know, we're not the unique as intelligent creatures in the universe. And that must have a, an enormous impact, and I hope a beneficial impact, um, because I think some of our problems that we have in the world today are due to extreme uh, narrow-mindedness in, in many ways. People pretend that the Earth is all there is, that humanity is the only intelligent species in the universe. A lot of political and religious ideologies are predicated on this very anthropocentric perspective. So if we find the extraterrestrial intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, then I, I hope it would trigger a more cosmopolitan outlook, which I think would be very beneficial. Um, but it is difficult to predict. I mean, it might it might not necessarily be beneficial if societies collapse or current religious or political ideologies were to completely collapse under the impact of this new discovery. It's diff it is difficult to predict how, how human society would respond. But in any case, however it responds, I think it would, it would be a profound um, change to our, our outlook. Mm -hmm. So would you say that if we were to discover life on other planets that astrobiology would add to the now long history of science of kicking us out of our central position in the universe like Copernicus and Galileo did with, yes. the, with the Earth and then Darwin with a life in general and, and then astrobiology would do it in the sense that even life itself would not be exclusive to Earth, right? Yes, yes, it would. It would do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, 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 but I, I think it would. It would by doing that. It would stimulate a much more um, cosmo. Well, I mean, cosmopolitan is the word I've been using, but co cosmocentric almost perspective uh, that we'd see ourselves m more as a a much bigger um, story in in the universe of which we are, you know, we, we, we're important to ourselves, of course, but we're only a component of a, a much grander evolutionary, cosmic evolutionary process. Um, but yes, I think it would be another step in the Copernican revolution. Um, there are, of course, other possibilities, though. Uh, everyone kind of assumes that we will find eventually these intelligent extraterrestrial intelligences uh, because the universe is so big and we think they must, if not be common, then at least, I mean, we don't know, you know, the Copernican paradigm may not extend this far. It, it, we haven't discovered any intelligent life in the universe. We don't know how easy it is for intelligent life to evolve from simple life. It might be really, really difficult I mean, it's not inconceivable that it hasn't happened anywhere else. It is possible that we might be all that there is in intelligent life in the universe. We, we, don't know, we don't know that that's not the case. So we have to be prepared for that as well. I mean, we, as we explore the universe, we might not find other intelligences because there might not be any. And that puts a tremendous responsibility onto our shoulders, I think. I mean, if human life, if, if, human, if humanity were to be the most evolved and most intelligent creature yet to appear in the universe, despite all of our flaws and failings, right? uh, that, that, that means the whole future of life in the universe would depend on us. So, so that puts a tremendous responsibility onto our shoulders that I, I just don't think human political institutions have yet, I mean, they're clearly not capable of grasping or dealing with that at all. But, but one day we might we might have to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Crawford, let's end the interview here. But just before we go, would you like to tell people what might be some of the best online sources if they want to get in touch with more of your work or even astrobiology in general? Well, my own work is easily found on the Birkbeck College <laughs> Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences website. 
Um, I, I mean, there's a huge literature out there. I couldn't, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how you would, how, how, how to point, uh, um, how to point people to, to a set of online resources. That would take a bit of uh, digging, I think. <laughs> Might be better addressed by email than, uh, <laughs> than off the top of my head. Okay, okay, so I will be leaving links to some of your work and also astrobiology in the description box of this video anyway. But Dr. Crawford, thank you a lot again for taking the time to come on the show and to be here with us today. And it was really an interesting conversation, so. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Hi there, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started my channel last year and I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Or alternatively, you can also do it on PayPal or Subscribestar. I will leave all the links in the description box. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, and my first producer, Isar Weber. Thank you for all.